Well, we just went to a uh, thing called uh, a place called Snake Discovery um, in St. Paul. Is it in St. Paul? Technically, uh, Maplewood. Maplewood, uh, Oakdale, um, and they're one of the. They're probably the at this point the largest um, YouTube channel for reptiles out there. It's called Snake Discovery, and they just had, they hosted an event. It's a, a build off championship to have a bunch of enclosures set just empty, yeah, right, right, or snakes or any type of reptile or amphibian, or, um, and um, had a bunch of other content creators come in to all take part in the challenge, trying to build up in seven hours, getting all the different supplies, trying to build the best enclosure they can. And this is the fourth year they've done it. So we were at the first year four years ago, um, and we he came in first place, I was in third place, and other brothers in second. So we got invited back to the like final championship over the other last three years they've hosted them. They invited all the top three winners back to have the final championship. So. We figured we'd talk about that and just catch up on we're friends from across the country. So searchable as reptiles. What are you doing over there? Looking at questions. Looking at questions. Are these questions for, for searchable as reptiles like over the years that we haven't answered? Is that what those are? Uh, what is that? No, this is a general. What instrument do you think is the most annoying? <laughs> you like that one? Garrett's voice. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Sorry, that was a... the next question is what is the coolest sound, and I had the same Garrett's answer. Voice. What? <laughs> um, most annoying instrument, man. Yeah, are we really rolling with that? Why you just picked off my? I don't know. I, it was it was there. What was it? Mm-hmm. Question twenty eight. Um, I think that. Well, you know, there's different levels of annoying, and different reasons for annoying. Like there's the sound. The, the sound of it, an inexperienced person trying to play the violin. Okay, we're going with this question. Bad. That's pretty bad, dude. I don't, I'm sure you've heard it before. It's kind of it's, it's amazing that somebody who knows how to play the violin. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. The, like if I tried to play the violin, it'd probably sound very much like an inexperienced person because I only played it once in fourth grade. But <clears throat> it's amazing that somebody else with the same instrument Ouch, back behind me. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna sit. Over, that's where you're gonna sit. We're gonna like sit side because I can't look oh. at you like this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, no, you can sit there if you want to. I see the shot you got for the camera now. I just. But this way, yeah, this way I can like. I was in the corner. I yeah. Kept sitting now we're back good. and back and back. You're and good right there. You're still in the shot. Um, well, I guess before we do that, we should just say like, for those of you that have been fans of the Search Rules Reptiles podcast, I'm very sorry <laughs> for the <laughs> lack of any kind of content. I think we even did record one after Tinley. How the last year? Did we put it up? It didn't get put up. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we've I'll... been recording religiously. <laughs> just with the zero don't uploads. Up- no. Don't upload. <laughs> no, I'll I'll make a point of finding that a and make sure that goes up before this one. Okay, so this is our second podcast, In... which means we're back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like six months ago. Wasn't that Something the October like that. one? Yeah, I think so. that sounds about right. I don't think it was the March one. No, so, we, yeah, no, I almost put up a the, year ago. Well, you know what? We'll we'll do another one next month when we go to Clint's thing. Oh, Clint's thing. Yeah. Okay. This is sounding official now. Yeah. But anyway, if it's your first time to the podcast, it might be your last time to the podcast as well, depending on how good we make on our promise to do another one. But my name is Garrett Hartle. My name is Brian Cusco. And this is Searchable as Reptiles. Um, yeah, dude. This is your idea. <laughs> this podcast. This podcast. Oh, oh, podcasting yeah. right now. Right, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think the podcast is good for you and I. And I think that a lot of people enjoy listening in on that, which is... Still strange, has always been strange to me. That was the idea behind the first podcast. Was yeah. like when we first started, it was like, oh, this is a great conversation. We should let other people in on it. Right, and and try to have those conversations. Like where, you know, I mean, we love, we start our little segment with some questions that we call Diving Deep in the Shallow End, which I do think is probably a better title for the podcast. Yeah. So if we're going to go back and do this regularly at any point, we should just rebrand and go for it. Um, But uh, I don't know that it is worth either of our time i just enjoy uh, the obvious draw for me was just i always enjoy our conversations um not necessarily if anybody's listening i actually enjoy them more i found out that when nobody's listening but i think over the course of doing the podcast it got to the point where we did reach that point where we were having conversations where i didn't feel like anybody was listening 
Well, so with anything with so, as with anything with social media, you know, you you have to be somewhat regular for it. I was thinking about how to do this. Just I, I enjoy problem solving. So how do you do this well in our situation? Because the conversations that happen with us the best are usually when we spend like a little too much time together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which but, is what a weekend. <laughs> Usually, yeah. Well, like if we go, so we, we go to a lot of events that are the same and we're there for whatever they are. We're just now coming off the Snake Discovery build off at the time of the recording of this podcast. And um, yeah, and then a lot of times we'll end up like, for example, at, when we used to do Tinley, you would fly to Pittsburgh instead of Chicago and we would do the drive out there and just hang, right? And then these conversations would come up or I would go to California for something and then come up to see you, which is usually like a couple of day ordeal. So you get the small talk out quick. And then you and I are pretty good at getting into, you know, deeper conversations that are a little off the wall sometimes. Oh, yeah. It's great. Love it. Those are the conversations that are good. Yeah, I agree. So having a, something that makes it intentional is great. But having to do it on a regular basis is what was very hard. Mm. At the point we... Just logistically. Yeah, but I mean, it's also kind of like, I don't feel like enough time has passed for us to have a really good version of that conversation, mm. or we're recording an episode because we need one for this month. Mm. And that's where you're like, well, I don't really have anything to say, but I have to upload, which is a constant struggle for, you know, YouTubers and anybody that makes any kind of content regularly. Yeah, true. Especially since both of us are doing that apart from this, you know, pretty regularly. Exactly. And we put all our stuff out there. So like the, the crossover or in between is sometimes relevant in light of our other con content that we put up. So, True. but when it goes a long time, it definitely becomes a lot easier to get into these kinds of conversations. Yeah. Well, I think that was, that was good. I mean, um, it seemed right to me when you're like, oh, we should, we should do a podcast. I was like, yeah, we haven't even had like a phone call <laughs> in a while. So there's yeah. probably plenty to catch up on. Like, you're clearly getting in better physical condition. I know I am too. Yeah. Um, which is awesome. <laughs> I don't know why we're doing it at the same the time. Tracking. Yeah. Without having I had no idea you were doing that. Yeah. But you showed up. I was like, dude, you're <laughs> like a brand new person. Half the man you were. <laughs> That's cool. That's good. And you picked up whatever I left off. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually lost. I actually lost weight since the last time you saw me. About really? 10 pounds. Yeah. Really? I, I just reallocated a lot of it you, that was some pretty serious reallocation you're looking <laughs> freaking jacked yeah uh, I, i've lost 40 pounds that's way more than i lost <laughs> yeah i lost well i haven't gained any of it back i'm actually cutting into into the muscle at this point but my wife is mad at me for doing it i'm like mm, you know you would think if I, your husband was fat you'd be like you need to lose a few and then he does you'd be happy but she doesn't understand my reasoning for it what is your reasoning? It's very important reason. Like, so you were telling me, let's just preface with your reason. You are saying like, hey, you know, like all the studying and stuff I've done seems to be that you, I mean, basically some, you could sum it up and say, use it or lose it, right? Yes. So you want to be and, and keep also, going for not a just, long time. Not just use it or lose it, but like you are losing it. And if you, if you don't constantly. want to lose it, then you better like use it. Yeah, you're constantly losing it even if you are using it. So you got to use it hard to yeah. like it be like, okay, we need more to keep using. Early. Well, and you even mentioned like, I want to stay on track. Both of us are kind of old for having kids our age. True. Yeah. Compared They're, to like, compared to general parents, society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we want to keep up with our kids, yes. our little kids. And then you, you were saying, I want to be able to keep up with my grandkids, yeah, which Lord are willing, yes. probably a decade off. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. So my reason was I had like, you know, weird health stuff going on earlier and some like gastrointestinal things. I was kind of dealing with it at Tinley or whatever. Didn't know what it was, ran a bunch of tests because there was like with the symptoms, there was like a threat that it could be some kind of cancer. Right. So they're like, well, let's look really into this. And so I spent thousands of dollars on tests and they found nothing. So that's always fun. That was yeah. my favorite type of tests. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like... Speaking give, of annoying instruments. <laughs> it's not the right thinking, but I was like, I, I should at least get some kind of cancer, so I got my money's worth out of those doctors, right? Wow. 
Of course you did. <laughs> I don't know why I feel that way. Has anyone else ever felt that way? Like, I wanted you to find something, and you're like, wait, no, I guess that's bad. Yeah, that is bad. I, I actually had blood work done for the first time in my life, like, a couple weeks or a month ago or something, yeah. just because I was talking to my doctor. and It's like a general Yeah, just general overall. Like, it, it was a lot, I guess, because, I, I, like I said, I'd never done it before ever in my life. And the clinic, they, when I was handing them in, the lady there was like, Oh wow, this is a lot. <laughs> I'm like, oh, is it? No, I don't remember. I've never had a blood test done, and apparently they ran like the gamut. Yeah. And anyway, what, what happened with yours? Oh well, nothing happened with the weight loss or with the with the thing. But one of the things the doctor told me was they're like, you're obese. And I was like, obese? That seems a bit harsh, you know. <laughs> and then they held up the old BMI chart, and. I'm looking at the weights, and I'm like, no, wait a minute. You know, they, they held up the chart, and they're like, here's the line. Like, you just crossed it by, like, a pound or two, and now you're technically obese for your weight and all this stuff. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see the rest of that chart. You know, like, where's the healthy weight range for a guy my height, right? We're close to the same height. I don't know. How tall are you? Like, 5'9". Yeah, say, so right there, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, so for a healthy weight for me, was somewhere from 135 to 165. And I was like, hold on a second. 135? Like, yes. Yes. So they, they allow for a little bit of a range there, 135 to 165. But I'm like, 135 is low. I, I haven't weighed 135 since I was a freshman. <clears throat> I don't think I weighed 135 as a freshman. <laughs> I know I graduated at a buck 85, and I was in yeah, very good shape. Yeah, you know thanks. what I mean? Played sports and all that stuff. And was very lean, not huge muscular, but you know what I mean? Definitely working out and all that stuff. So I was like, this is, is crazy, you know? So my family, like I'm a mix. My, my dad's side of the family are like tall, skinny, string bean type, right? Like if they stop working out, they immediately start losing muscle and get really skinny. My mom's side of the family are absolute tanks. Like you pick the little kids up. They're not fat or whatever. You could be like two years old and you're like, oh, that kid's heavy. You know what I mean? All the babies are born four pounds heavier, you know, than, like, I, I think I was a 10-something pound baby, you know what I mean? Uh, my family regularly has, like, 12-pound babies on that side. So they're just dense, right? So, and then short. So me in the middle, you know, I, I tend to, like, gain weight if I start working out. I pack muscle on very easily when I try. It's very hard for me to actually lose weight. I just convert it from fat to muscle. Right. Um, so anyway, I'm looking at this BMI thing and even at the upper range, 165, I'm like, that's very light. Like if I, if, if I had to get, so at the time of the, the hospital thing, right, I was, I was 205. Right. So I'm like, if I have to get to 165, I'm going to lose a lot of functional muscle. Now I certainly had weight to lose as far as like excess fat, <clears throat> but 165, I'm like, that's quite small, you know, and that's a large percentage of my body weight to lose. Um, but, yeah, so my reasoning for it was like, that's so stupid. I'm doing it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Fantastic. So awesome. That's why I'm doing it. So yeah. next time we podcast, I'll probably be back up to 205 because I'm like, I did it. No, man. Don't but do anyway, it. I'm, I'm teetering. I, I crossed the threshold. I hit 165. I got down to like, you know, you vary like, I vary like three, four pounds by the day sometimes, right? So you're just up and, up and down. It's mostly water weight. It's not like a true, you yeah. know, you, you got to kind of like right. track yourself over time. And again, this is for BMI. So it was not for health. It was just for the number. And so I, you know, got down to the 165-ish, like, you know, 162 to 168, you know. And so I'm like, there I am at 165. And like, so like right now, like I feel good. I don't have hardly any fat on me but i'm also feel very skinny and significantly weaker mm. you know to lose that like i got down i went back down to 185 and to me that felt good that felt right i had muscle still strong you know what i mean but i had lost what what has been your i mean obviously the most uh, successful way to lose weight is just being a calorie deficit that's pretty much the only way you can there's it's not possible to lose weight in any other way you yeah being a calorie deficit yeah. so what was your process of doing that well so like my wife was also getting into it now this is funny i'm sure we've talked about on this podcast but i was like vegan for years mm -hmm. you know and that was kind of like i'm doing it also <laughs> like 
you know, I, there's, I liked a lot of the reasons behind it, but like the real reason Garrett Hartle decided to do it was like <laughs> vegan now. You know what I mean? <laughs> Such a nerd. Yeah. Um, no, but, but how? Okay, so you... so how I did it was I my my wife was losing weight too, and she was doing like a keto thing. So I flipped from vegan to like we only eat meat, meat and cheese fat. now. <laughs> yeah, which is probably the source of all those stomach issues. <laughs> uh, well, also you took a bunch of you were on a crazy amount of antibiotics for a while too, right? Yeah, the Lyme's disease thing like jacked my stomach up. Yeah. So that's because way the way more sensitive than it ever has been in life. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Interesting cause... podcast by Andrew Huberman on um, gut biome, and mm. it's I listened to it on the plane uh, a couple weeks back or whatever, and it's pretty interesting and definitely insightful for like that. Yeah, I, I regularly nuke mine. You know, what I mean, I'm yeah. sure my gut biome looks like the surface of the moon or right. something it's yeah like, that's it's throw pretty, some more asteroids at it and then go amazing. doctor what's happening <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was pretty interesting to hear like how much it affects everything which i've kind of known a little bit you know with all the different nerve endings in the stomach and and whatnot but and even from songs like from system of a down like my my tapeworm tells me where to go <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I I just think we were made to have like a far more vast and varied diet of mm. local raised totally. food Ooh, than what we do. One of the interesting things that you talked about was like how when you're very young, which makes sense, like the more stuff you're exposed to, the more wide variety of flora and fauna you have in your gut biome. Like if for life. When, yeah, for life. Wow. When you're a kid, like, from, you know, from being a baby to like two or three years old, like. The more like if you're supposed to pets, like if you're allowed to play in the dirt, like different things like that, like affects you for the rest of your life. Yeah, um, kind of sets you up for I don't know the ability to have a much more diverse gut biome. Um, yeah, which I'm sure both of us had, most of us growing up in the '80s <laughs> or any time before baby bubbles were a thing um, or yeah, ex excess helicopter parenting and whatnot. Yeah, well, I think I increased mine with the little challenge before the build off yesterday just by sucking up that water and oh, yeah. running it with it in my mouth so that I had more carrying see, capacity. See, the, the only reason I didn't do that, I thought all kinds of stuff like that. I was like, I could just go there and drink it now and then pee by the time <laughs> it's time to actually do it. <laughs> but I was like, I don't want to. I don't want to be the first person to cheat. We'll let, <laughs> we'll let Garrett do it. And then as soon as I, as soon as I saw you doing it, I was like, yep. I'm in. <laughs> So technically, it was Clint that was trying to cheat, and they they said you have to use these. Uh, there was a bucket we had to scoop little bits of water out and dump in another bucket right. across the parking lot. My first thought was like, I'm just gonna grab the bucket and I'll just dump That's it. That's what we did too. Did you see that? And no, they sent I us back. I, was like, I realized that was Clint's I, idea. I had the fourth thought to think, no, that's like obvious cheating. You can't just take the so whole Clint, bucket. So Clint uh, went up to Ed and Emily and was like. They're like, so you have to use the, they were like little pet water bowls, you know, like that you would get at a Petco or something, little fake rock blue and pink ones. Very shallow. Yep, very shallow. Probably very hold a, a cup of water, yeah, you know. Not even. Yeah, and uh, not the way I was running. <laughs> and you had to use the water bowls to move the water. So Clint's thought was, everybody grab a water bowl and press it on the side of the bucket and carry the bucket, touching only the water bowls. <laughs> And they're like, that's cheating, go back. And then, but, you know, in a technically, strictly technical sense, he was doing what they said to do. <coughs> yeah, the same so, way that you can, like, argue that, you know, uh, what, that, what's, what's one of the more heinous Well, you know ones? Clint. Yeah, like, go look like at the, any of his phylogeny bees, videos. Bees or wasps or ants or wasps. And whales or fish. Whales or fish. And <laughs> people or fish. In the, yeah, in the strictest <laughs> sense, technically speaking, and with a little bit of mental gymnastics. So, so anyway, what I did was the old, like, bobbin for apples style where I would scoop my little cup up and then I would go and suck up as much water as I could and then run, which it's really hard to run and not breathe and, like, Especially if you got your face too far in when you were sucking the water oh, see, up and it's like in your nose. I wasn't, I was so focused on what we were doing. I wasn't totally paying. I just heard somebody say, Garrett's drinking. I, I didn't need to see anything. I just heard Garrett's put it in his mouth. I was like, well, so am I. <laughs> what, what, what I was doing, I had, I had the, I had the cup. I'd, I'd sip it out of the cup just as easier, you know, put it into the cup and then yep. get it into the mouth. And then I'd also have some in the cup. That's so was, what I did. Too. Okay, you're doing that. Yeah, so I had it in my mouth and the cup and yeah. then I'd run across and like, I kind of like spit it into the cup as I was dumping. Because I was actually trying to hide the fact I was clearly cheating from the most technical standpoint. What I was doing, there's no way it was allowed. Yet Ed was like, I guess that's okay. And I was like, your inconsistencies are killing me, man. Well, I think 
it was the amount of like self harm that comes with that form of cheating, or potential, you know, just like how not, not deleterious it is to your health necessarily, but just to your ego and like your you know says like oh you you drank that did you put that in your mouth it's like oh okay he's down pretty on your dedicated. Knees, boy. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think Ed and Emily are okay with anything as long as you're very dedicated and it's not that efficient. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's like easy and then you win, they're like no. Yeah, because you guys actually tried to cheat on a few different things. Um, your team in general, not just you, but it was me and Clint on the team. Yeah, we well, were the well, most it was vocal. Bob that was. Uh, Doing the real, yeah, the real cheap. I put them up to it. Uh, I was like, look, thing. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> so they had like a little lift the ball. What I loved about that, well, there's a number of things I loved. I loved that so much that I did it when no, nobody was even watching. I saw, I watched oh, it. You watched? Too, right? <laughs> I was like, look at this guy. <laughs> so winning the first time wasn't enough for him. He wanted to go back and see why he won. How so did he win? If you haven't seen the videos yet, and you're only, you only listen to this podcast, you should definitely go look at the the cool thing that uh, Ed and Emily built. It was like a piece like of ultimate, plywood and they, it was like routed game. out yeah so it's like a imagine like a giant i think the best way to imagine it is like a, a big um cornhole platform and instead of a just the hole at the top and instead of a full sheet of plywood for the cornhole board they cut out and routed out a snake out of the what would be the platform of the cornhole board and then there's still a hole at the top by the snake's head and you stand it up. So instead of laying on the ground, the, the corner bullet board is standing up. And then there's these two strings attached to a teeter-totter or a seesaw um, piece of flat wood that slides it, up. It worked like a guillotine on right, the like front of Right, like a guillotine, totally. And there's a little golf ball <clears throat> that is being you lift up with by pulling the strings on these pulleys on either side of that guillotine. And then get try to get the golf ball up as it's running along the snake. Um, at that angle, because it's like kind of like cornhole board is about a I don't know, probably like a 80 degree angle or 60 degree angle, something like that. Um, not 80, more like 75, 60. Um, and then make the ball run up the snake as you pull the guillotine up with the two strings and pulleys on either side. And so it's like you're playing with pulling the left side higher or pulling the right side higher to make the ball run left or right across the guillotine and run this, you know, curvy S snake. Up to the top. It was a very and curvy, like it went up very and then back down. And yeah. the thing was only like five inches wide, maybe. Totally. You know? Yeah, not even, yeah, barely. Um, and maybe at the widest point, five inches. And, yeah. And then once, and then try to get it to the hole at the top of the snake's head. Um, but the way the guillotine is, was made, there's actually a couple little balls at either end. So you could, it wouldn't be as easy to let it just run off the end. If you slowly rolled the golf ball to one end, there was like a little corner it could sit in. And so Bob was trying to, apparently at your behest, was trying to just let it rest in that little corner and slide it all the way up the side, not even really touching the snake cut out. Yeah. Just kind of up the side. And what I literally loved is that Ed and Emily let Didn't him say anything. get it all the way up to the of top. Of course you love that because that's how you won. No, that's not how I won. Yeah. I won by actually doing it oh, and getting the ball wow, in the that's, hole. Yeah. <laughs> that was Victory. part of how we won. Yeah. We, that was only a small fraction of that. That was a 25% of the challenge <laughs> was that event. Um, but I just, I was, I was like, I was like, did they really win by cheating that hard? And I was like, oh, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did love that. I was like, yes, <laughs> you have to run the snake. Let them live with their consequences. That was, and that, I love that. I thing. saw Emily's little wrap up at the end. She was filming and she's like, gosh, because it ended up being fairly close. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you guys won, what was it, maybe, maybe 10 seconds. Maybe. Oh, at the very end? At the very end, oh, yeah. all the things yeah, together, you guys won by about 10 seconds yeah, totally. to finish all the challenges. Right. Now, we were set back a lot yes. uh, the first time we cheated because we were trying to carry the bucket, and they did the same thing there. They're like, go back, start again. So we went all the way back, and you guys already had then some water in your and, and we already we even got the little snake. We, the little code for the first box was a bunch of snakes laying on the ground on the other side of a line that you couldn't cross, and you had to use snake hooks to try and grab all these rubber snakes. And on the bottom of one of those snakes was one of the codes to the box to get the blocks to make the yeah. final puzzle. Um, they get more complicated every year. Yeah, it was cool. It was really awesome. But um, we but we beat you on that event. No, right? we got that first. So we were kind of ahead right at the beginning. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, right. right from the first. We got that snake code first, and then moved on to the next thing. Well, yeah. So they sent us back on that, and then I was like, "Hey, Bob, look, you can just angle that thing, that guillotine, all the way to one side. The ball will sit there, and there was enough track behind it, barely, to like just pull it straight up and dump it in the hole." So then we had to start over again with that. That was a very challenging, like, 
it was a fun little thing. They should leave it out because it was just kind of fun to try to do. It was yeah. challenging enough to do on its own, but it was very challenging to do in a competitive timed event, right? That's yeah. what made it like so my, hard. My, it, totally, and because you really had to focus. And then, like, one of the things that was a struggle for me when I was doing it was the team would, like, be cheering me on. I was just like, shh, yeah. shut up. Don't say, don't say go, Brian. I, I mean, don't want to hear, I really want to hear techni- nothing. Technically, it was. <laughs> a variant of golf right so yeah. like everyone shut up and give me a little golf clap at the end <laughs> Totally. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh emily was filming her little thing she's like gosh you know we were green team you were black team she's like gosh green team probably wouldn't have won if they hadn't tried to cheat so much <laughs> you know and it was definitely mostly me and clint so we also had tyler on our team um tyler ruggy and uh bob bledsoe and then Chris from Garden State. I don't know their last Garden name. Garden State Tortoise? Yeah. What's what's their last name? Uh, Leon. There Leone? Chris Leon. Yeah. So, um, at any rate, yeah, it was good. It was a good event. That was fun. Yeah, yeah it was a blast. That I was loved a good it. Team. It was so much fun. This way, it's, it, I'm biased because, you know. Because you won? Yeah. I was more, besides just winning, like, the overall, the finishing thing, just getting that snake thing in there, dude, I was, I was a little bit extra... I know that I'm competitive, like, <laughs> but it's times like that. It's times like that when it really comes out <laughs> where I'm ready to stab someone in the eye if it's required. <laughs> no, well, that, like at Clint's thing when we're doing the, the the shooting thing, you know, and like, yeah. and then yeah. people were like, "Oh, thanks for shooting me in the face." I was like, "Dude, that was the point." She's <laughs> trying to, if you, and I was like, "If, if you, you're only sticking your face on the uh, outside of the." blockade that's what i'm gonna aim for like yeah. stick out your hand if you don't want to get shot in the face <laughs> <laughs> well i'll say who did i drill at the end because he had those like very powerful nerf guns like they hurt when you got hit oh yeah it felt like it was close to airsoft this thing smacked it was yeah cool. so it was very cool um but i i like at one point in those races because i hung pretty much to the end too um but at one point i like stormed the you know, the last person that was, like, holed up at the, at the end there. Who was it? Oh, it was um, paleontology. Um, I just met them for the first time that weekend. Mm. What was it? The um, Oh, gosh, guys, I'm sorry. For, <laughs> I'm not thinking of your name here. Yeah, it was a great, great paleontology channel for sure. The, yeah, the gal from uh, Paleo. Was it Paleo World? I don't want to say it wrong because I'll be close, and then it'll be the wrong YouTube channel. But at any rate. Yeah, you, th- you, t- you tell the story, I'll, I'll look it up. <clears throat> okay. Well, I, yeah, so uh, this guy and girl that came from the channel, and she was crushing it. She was doing really good. Paleoanalysis. Paleoanalysis. There you go. So I, I didn't want to say the wrong one because, like, so many YouTube channels that are, like, close. So the, the gang from Paleoanalysis. Um, but, yeah, she was very good at that event. Oh, yeah, like, she was. Yeah, she was, like, a she had, like, marksman training or something. <laughs> a lot of the girls that competed in that event were acting like now i have nothing against girls i think a lot of times they're actually better shooters and strategists with stuff than the guys are because we come in with all our bravado but a lot of the girls in that event were like oh gee you know i don't know maybe can i sit this one out and then they just like freaking wrecked everybody like they were (laughs) so good so uh but at any rate she was very good so i stormed the end and i was just like I had a good amount of adrenaline going. Like, you cross that threshold where, like, this is not a game anymore. Yeah. And so I went in. You only have to shoot him once. But I got up to, like, pretty much point blank on her and was like, bah, 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 And about 10 shots in, she's going, ow, ow. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, gosh. I kind of snapped out. I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you can shoot me, too, if you want. Like, I, how can I, like, I just... I clearly hit her with the first one, but I just kept drilling her. We just jumped challenge. We we went back way, way back in time. So We're many supposed to be talking challenges. about the snake discovery challenge. Uh, well, you know, kind of <laughs> diving deep off the, the shallow end. <laughs> so I don't remember what the original instrument question was. Was it the most annoying sounding instrument? It, you know, it's just the most annoying instrument. Period. Okay, then then if that's the question again. Like, it doesn't have to be. Everyone, just... Well, everybody likes to accuse us of cheating, but I'm like, no, I need to know the rules exactly so that I can play this as not intended. Because clearly for me and Clint, for some reason, that gives us a rush. Like, the rules clearly state <laughs> I do not want to do this normally for some reason. But at any rate, if that's the question, then the most annoying instrument is the harmonica. Mm, because what? it's super cool instrument. 
it fits in your pocket. It goes anywhere. It's so soulful and such a great instrument. And, and yet you have to be able to like breathe in and out while playing and not pass out. It's very annoying to learn. <laughs> I mean, for someone that like grew up having issues with asthma and limited lung capacity. I mean, I'm like, gonna... I want to play this instrument and I can kind of do it really good for like 20 seconds and then physically I die. Okay, so at this point, we're not talking about like which the most, which I think we can cover the whole spectrum, but at this point, we're talking about not the sound, not the most, the sound, but what that was the most annoying yeah, to like. Because you're try right, a violin is, is very annoying when people are learning it. You know, uh, a lot of the wind instruments are very annoying when right. people are learning it sounding. But to me, the harmonica is the most frustrating because it's like on one level, it's an easy buy in. Like, I need, guitar to, I need is to easy. stop you with your reasoning for a second <laughs> okay, because you're your... saying that the breathing is like difficult. I mean, yes, you do breathe. So but annoying. this like the one one of the few instruments, one of the few wind instruments that you can play by breathing in or out. You don't have to like of all the other wind instruments, trumpets, clarinets, all these other things. You can't breathe in and make a sound <laughs> with them that sounds like the music at all. Yeah. You have to blow out. So the harmonica is the one that you can like this give you a little bit of grace where it's like, oh, breathe out or in and you'll still play it. Yeah, it, it, you would think so, <laughs> but it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, because like if you're playing a, a trumpet or something, you can just go, <gasps> and then you push out for a while, but and then you the, take you a break, and you you put your breaths in a place. But with the harmonica, a, you're like, no, there's a note here where there should be a breath, and that, that note goes. So it's it's not enough of a breath. It's like super. Uh, maybe okay. it's just a mental thing. Yeah. But it's like you can survive taking normal depth of breath, right? And you can survive taking a tiny little teaspoon of a breath in and out rapidly for a long time. Okay, I can but see your point. But you start to feel like you're drowning. <laughs> I can see your point. Yeah, I see the other. <laughs> I get it, I get it. Yeah, it's too much. It's like too many outs and then an in and then not enough of an in. And you're not taking your mouth off of it to get that good breath in between. I mean, yeah, I'm sure you can, you? but no, I wish. I. It's the one instrument that, like I said, it's an easy enough buy-in. You can learn it in, like, you can just sit there. They make like little tabs for them that they yeah, fold out paper that comes with the harmonica. That's what's not annoying about it. It's like most people can pick it up and like play something reasonable. Yep. And then it's because of the way you breathe, right? right? It's very natural. It's almost like singing, not using your own vocal cords, which yeah. mine, after an event like this, I always sound like a frog, you know? So it's so cool because I can just right outside my mouth use another vocal cord that's beautiful regardless of what mine is in my throat, you know? So I, it's like, it's right there. You just can't breathe. <laughs> so it's like, here's, most of these instruments require years of practice and skill and theory and, and being able to read music and all this stuff. And the harmonica is like, you need none of that. It's super easy, but, but yeah. well, you don't get to breathe anymore. Mm. It's and like, I, oh, I'm gonna that is still so dis annoying. I'm still disagree with you. Like, so annoying. It's one of the, again, I'm going to just hold on my position, which is a fact, <laughs> that you can play the harmonica by breathing in and out. <laughs> <laughs> and that not only can you, but that is how the instrument is played. <laughs> this, this whole conversation is making me feel like I need to take a deep breath. <laughs> so for me, if we're talking about, like, <laughs> logistics and, and, like, playing it, the most annoying instrument is a saxophone. Because I've I learned to play like I know how to play the clarinet. I I can still play the clarinet to this day. Yeah. I can like play, you know, I don't know, Mary Had a Little Lamb or like um Joy to the World or something on yeah. the clarinet. I know how to do it. I know the fingerings and I do the little reed armature and everything. And saxophone is like for all for all intents and purposes, basically just a little slightly curved clarinet. Okay. And yet it's so different with the keys and the fingerings to play and Every time I've tried to play it, I'm like, this is this is a waste of time. I can't <laughs> I can't possibly play it. I've learned, you know, as some, somebody who's it's a musician. It's an advanced who, instrument. It is. It's, and somebody who's a musician who's played lots of different instruments professionally. Yeah. It's frustrating and annoying. The saxophone is, is, the, is the one instrument people are like, oh, what is you play? I'm like, whatever. You, what do you need? The keyboards, yeah. guitar, drums, bass, whatever, you know, clarinet, trombone, but not saxophone. Yeah. Anything but the saxophone. And then it turns out it was invented in Belgium, which became a point of contention with my brother-in-law's best friend, uh, who's from Belgium, as he hung out in my parents' front yard and was giving all the reasons why Belgium is greater than any other country. Oh, so you want to hate it extra because you're tired of hearing how great Belgium is from this kid? 
yeah, it was. It got a little annoying. <laughs> he was one of the few people that I that I was close to physically assaulting ever in, in life. I mean, You've never very, been there with me. Such a Come short on. list. No, I've never felt like I've I've like playfully assaulted you, <laughs> but not. I, it's something that I that I do enjoy about my ability of self control. No matter how angry I might get at somebody, I that has virtually never manifested into physical abuse. Um, and there's a, it's a very, very short list of literally two people that ever ca even came close. Yeah. And he was one of them. Yeah. Very close. I actually did, like, technically, <laughs> physically <laughs> touch him. But that was in the defense of my grandparents. So that I felt like that was kind of mm -hmm. justified. And you wanted to do so much more than I you did. did so oh, yeah. Totally all, I did was, all I did was drag him off the dance floor and yeah. take him off to the side and let him know that if he didn't stop approaching my grandmother, he would be unconscious in the bushes. And that was it. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else happened. <laughs> I, I, my thoughts go so much more extreme than that. Like, all I did, officer, all I did was murder the guy. You should have seen what I wanted to do to the corpse. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I wanted, like, Old Testament biblical <laughs> vengeance. He, he gave a very heartfelt apology, um, you know, later when he got back to Belgium, from Belgium. But uh, that was cool. Tone, I love you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's um, funny. But, yeah, violin for annoying sound. But there's, there's, what about for you? Is there, like, an annoying, or, or a recorder? Like, somebody that just has no intention of playing a recorder, like, in any way, shape, or form to make it sound good, and they just blow into it as hard as they can? Hey, well, that's why I said, like, a lot of wind instruments are very annoying, you know. And then the, the stringed instruments that have a bow are, are annoying in the beginning stages. But that is forgivable, because you're not playing it the way it's meant to be played. You know, harmonica, guitar, those are much more approachable instruments where in an afternoon you can kind of do something with it that sounds okay. You know, a, a guitar is hard to be really annoying unless it's got all kinds of, you know, electric guitar effects on it. Well, actually, which I guess is true for most instruments, like somebody who has no idea, even like a, the drums, they're, they're pretty yeah. loud. If somebody has no rhythm whatsoever and they're just right. trying to figure it out, it's like, and they're just like, <laughs> all of the cymbals are just right. like, oh, God, please stop. Yeah. Let's take a break. Right. Um, but, but what about you could also sit on a bass drum and just go boom, boom, and it's nice. Yeah, that's right? very nice. Or or a piano and go ding, ding. That singular note. That can sounds be all really kinds nice. of things. It could be like a but eyes like wide you shut. said with a. <laughs> but uh, but then you say uh, like a wind instrument where it's like <laughs> you're like oops that didn't work. So what is the most annoying instrument, even if played well by a professional? That's a good question, I think. I mean, I think you're starting to get into some of the culturally traditional ones, like bagpipes are beautiful, mm. but also kind of annoying. Do you know what a hurdy-gurdy is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Super annoying. Also cool. I, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. No, but it, it, it's like kind of an annoying sound. So it's like, you know what, that piece of art that you look at, if we're speaking like from visual senses, you look at the piece of art, and part of what makes it intriguing is like, wait, there's something off. Like, if we want to relate it to the build-off, it was Clint's build. You're like, what's off? Mm. And he changed the angle of the floor in his build. Yes. And there was nothing necessarily... It was a nice build, you know, but there was nothing necessarily... Like the corner, the top corner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone's going to find out about that if they don't listen to this podcast. We can get into that in a minute. because We should break down the build-off for people because they'll be listening to this after all the stuff is released. So... Um, but anyway, what, what made his build so intriguing, so interesting, is that he took the floor and he raised it up to a 45-degree angle. So you're looking at it. If you stared into the cage long enough without the context of the room around it, you felt like you are going to fall over. Mm. It was almost like one of those. Especially because the, sh the ship was in there. I mean, he had a pirate ship. Yeah, like, there were two different into... perspectives going on. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, like, the land mass, he had, like, little pirate chairs and stuff set up. And those they were, were all on level. one perspective. Yeah. And then the ocean, the water, which is the part that should always be level, was not. Yes. So, you're sitting there going, oh, it's, like, not working in my brain. It's almost frustrating me, but it's super cool. Yeah. So, that's where I think the hurdy-gurdy or those things fall. It's almost like an optical illusion of the ears where, like, the bass noise is like, eh, <laughs> which is a really... It's very close to Dumb and Dumber. He's like, you want to hear the most annoying noise ever? And then that's the noise of the instrument. It's like playing that noise in, in like a beautiful way. Well, you know, it makes sense. Is like the, 
the recorder and the, the one I happen to bring up is yep. part of a bagpipe situation. It's basically the, the yep. part they play on is the recorder. And the, it, the way that it's played is not by somebody gently blowing into it. It's by squeezing a squeezing bag and a forcing bladder. as much air through it as possible yeah. with this bag. Play this recorder extra violently. <laughs> that makes sense. And then do it really in, a, in the most soothing way possible so that we can play it at this funeral. <laughs> wow. wow. It's two, two different perspectives going on at yeah. once, right? I think that's why it probably works really well. I mean, the best bagpipe scenario I've ever heard was, you know, is... Uh, Long way to the top if you want to rock and roll ACDC. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, just, I had a flashback. Go ahead, finish your thought. That, that, no, that's just that. That, you know, it like fits very well into some rock and roll, and they're just rolling down the street on this big float, and Angus is just blaring on the bagpipe. And just, yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing with classic rock. Any, well, any electric guitar where you're adding distortion to the sound. It becomes intriguing when played well because it's a distorted sound. Mm. So it's off. It's like an extra plane of perspective totally. that shouldn't be there that makes you go, huh. But, yeah, so <laughs> I just had this thought. My sister, Brittany, the younger one that likes eating ice cream with you or whatever, uh, she, uh, she, we were listening to, I think it, it was some soundtrack. Maybe it was Braveheart or something where they were playing some bagpipes in there. And she goes, you know how I think bagpipes were, bagpipes were invented? And I was like, no, how? And I think she was like younger, but not that young, maybe like 16 or something. She goes, I think a seagull got a straw stuck in its throat and someone stepped on it. That's like, not far from like what it actually is. <laughs> I was like, and then they just started rhythmically squeezing seagulls and sticking straws. I'd be willing to bet that like the bag itself was probably some kind of animal, animal bladder. bladder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in fact, you know, Guinness, speaking of like, you know, Gaelic ish countries, Scottish, Irish, um, Guinness, one of the ingredients in the beer for the longest time, fish, know, heads, right? fish bladder. Oh, it was a bladder. I fish thought it was bladder. head. Yeah, yeah. and then they, they took it out back in like the late '90s, early 2000s, supposedly. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I didn't even think it was that long ago. I thought it was like 2010 or something. Because I remember me being 21 and drinking it, and then hearing that they changed the recipe, which I was like, "You can't do that for a beer that's been around for like longer years. than." Yeah, the or United States or whatever. Yeah, it's been around for a long time. Not nine hundred years. Sorry. I think it was four hundred years. Nine hundred like, without changing the recipe. Nine hundred is the number I'm thinking. Of. Arthur Guinness signed the uh, lease at the Guinness storehouse for nine thousand years. Yeah, yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Or nine hundred, nine thousand nine hundred. Either way, it's a long, long lease. You can't change the recipe after that. No, you know what I mean. You're like this beer has been around so much longer than you've been alive. And yeah, you're just gonna step in and mess it up. This makes me wonder how much of it was just like marketing and whatnot like was did they actually change it was there ever really fish bladder i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i mean it makes sense i think it kind of was yeah but it tastes, tastes kind of oily not as good without the fish bladder no you need the oiliness mm. it's like uh bulletproof coffee you need the coconut oil in there you're like yeah it's a weird well, flavor like it though have to be coconut oil yeah kind of. it could just be you can be just butter you can just put a tablespoon of butter in that sucker that's bulletproof coffee well, i do like butter and coconut oil and then if you take the coconut oil out you're like nah. mct oil yeah right or yeah. coconut oil isn't that mct is it's derived, derived from coconut yeah, yeah for sure but but anyway i was doing that for a while that's part of, oh that's part of your keto thing oh, that's when i was doing it when i was getting into the keto thing yeah bulletproof coffee. Well, so so you know circling all the way back down to that weight loss thing like i dropped a certain amount i got to like 175 which is kind of skinny garrett really that's the weight that i'm at but down then to get that last 10 pounds is a lot harder so then no I had kidding to, then i've been I trying to get cut. down to 172 for like 10 <clears throat> years dude yeah it, that Hard. like if you get beyond the skinny version of yourself you have to go pretty extreme so I cut calories. I stayed doing the no carbs, right? Not necessarily like strictly keto, but like little to no carbs. And then, uh, and then beyond that, like to knock myself down to the next plateau, I, I cut calories severely. And my wife's like, well, you hit like the 165 now, so can you just be normal again? And I was like, nah, you know, I haven't really thought this through, like how far I'm going to go or at what point am I going to change or whatever. But I was like, I kind of want to hit 135, but that's just crazy. Even though the BMI is like, nope, still healthy, you know, not underweight at all. But I'll tell you, when I lived in Indonesia, I got really, really sick, and I got down to, I don't want to get the right weight. I was at 185, 
and I lost 50 pounds. See, I was at 135, which they're considering healthy, and I looked like a corpse. You know what I mean? Like whatever density, you know, people, I'm big bone or whatever, but that's yeah. to a certain extent, that's a thing. You well, know? you see people, I mean, you, you're used to yourself and how your build is, and well, I'm used to myself <clears> and how my build is. You know, you get used to that, and that's what you can say, oh, this is me healthy because this is what I'm at. This is what I rest at, you know, usually in, in a place where we have constant right. access to food and, and all yeah. these things. But then, like, if you look at, at Clint, like, he's healthy, and he, we see him as healthy because Very. that's how we know Clint. And Absolutely. He's, and he is healthy. He's, yep. um, and but yet if we if one of us was that skinny and we'd look at ourselves and be like what has happened to me I am almost I've wasted away. Well, I don't. I don't because think it's. We're not used I don't think that. it's even what you look like. Because for me, it's not even. It wasn't really about looks. You know, it was like we're looking what like a corpse. What you feel like. <laughs> yeah. Feeling well, like a I felt like I was. Yeah. <laughs> That's because you were sick. <laughs> well, even after I had recovered, you know what I mean. But I still was very thin. Yeah. I got that thin because I was very sick. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it has but a very I, bad connotation. <laughs> but then after the illness was gone, just being at that weight, I was like, I feel frail, very mm. frail. Whereas Clint is thin, but he's quite strong. Ooh, there's, there's a big difference between, <clears throat> I know we're supposed to talk about the build-off. There's, there's a huge difference between uh, strength or size and strength. Even with muscle, A, you could be like yeah, very like ripped and have big, large muscle. Yeah. And not be nearly as strong who has somebody who has much smaller muscles. That's kind of the Arnold Schwarzenegger complex, right? When he got in in his early bodybuilding days, he would do a lot of workouts with smaller weights than most of the guys at the gym. Yeah. And they're like, ah, oh, look at you with your small I, I weights. Versus... And he always would be like, look at you with your small muscles. Yeah. And what do you want? Totally. Yeah. Want big Hi, weights? Hypertrophy big muscles? versus strength training. I'm learning about it right now. So it's, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. interesting stuff. The, the way that you train it and the results that come and you can you obviously do build some strength with even hypertrophy training because you are getting bigger muscles and you are using them and, right but not nearly as much strength gain as if you just do the ones that don't actually really grow your muscles all that much well and your muscles aren't the only things that make you strong either. right you have the, to have very tendons. strong connective tissues right and which is and where that's where you get that farm in. boy strength totally. that they talk about you know? with really heavy weight not too much but also but also a lot not, yep. not and, too many and repetitive, repetitive in the repetitive. right ways. Yes. Where you're using full body, you have good posture. Yep. And then very heavy, you're maxing it out, and then it, your whole body builds up. But, totally. Um, so you keep saying we're supposed to talk about the build off. I feel like this is an off topic kind of thing, but I, I feel like people will probably want to know about the build off. So, yeah. Well, <clears throat> what I thought was interesting about it, well, it was fun, obviously. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. I thought Ed's like little thing about like when you, when you try to get him to like divulge what his thoughts were about anybody's individual enclosure, and he wasn't willing to do that, and still isn't willing to do that. Yeah. But he was willing to say that overall, his his initial reaction of the first couple of years or the first years, and he's like, oh, oh, like there's a little wow, oh wow, they like, people stepped up, wow, wow, people stepped it up, and then this final championship thing, his thing was not wow, but huh. <laughs> I, I repeated the story and I said, yeah. And then he said, meh. And he's like, no, I didn't say meh. I said, huh. There's a difference. He's there like, is a difference. He's like, meh is like a low huh. And huh is like a not bad, but not as good as I thought. Yeah, right. And that was just an overall. Um, and I thought it was interesting because it did seem, you know, some of the enclosures I look at and I'm, I'm like, it's just for me, you know, this is just my own personal taste, obviously. But it's like you got a dirt you know background and like or it's you know plants and beautiful very naturalistic looking and cool i really liked um chris and casey's like the, that picture fit in very well with the stuff they put the in garden state tortoise garden yeah. state tortoise thing. i said the same thing you did i was like it looks like you took this beautiful picture and made it 3d yeah that's it did a great and job of that classic garden the state more tortoise. i looked at it the more i would just sit there and be like i was like, i actually want to be in this enclosure yeah like i <laughs> yeah you're drawn in and yet, but just looking at, just glancing at it, like compared to like all the other, yeah, it's just a piece of like nature put in a box. Yep. And it's like, but with good composition. Really great composition. It was some of the best composition. <clears throat> yeah, if not the best. Yeah. Um, this is, yeah, the rules of third, like the golden ratios and stuff that that existed within that enclosure. Yes. But for me, I look at those and I'm like, yeah, I've seen it, seen it, seen it. I think that's so. What's interesting is the way that that Ed said that was dead on. But I think if you go contestant by contestant, they hit that point differently. At different times and totally. In different ways. Yeah. But they all arrived at, huh. <laughs> sure. Of, so his, yeah, his point was like every year there was like a wow, clear winner basically or two or three or whatever. Um, but this year he was just kind of like, 
okay, you know, like yeah, <clears throat> he felt like it was stepping up and up and up and up, and then you got there. And so as long as you're talking about all considering all enclosures, my point to Ed was there is definitely a top that you can achieve in the given circumstances. Right. It is a very small amount of time yes. to do a lot. And if he felt like we were going up and up and up and up, <clears throat> I, I said from the beginning, you know, for this championship round, the major change, the biggest change was that they went from a four-foot enclosure to a six-foot enclosure. Mm -hmm. So it's 30% more space, 30% more build, uh, many times more possibilities, and then also um, it, not much more time. <laughs> right. It was like 10% more time yeah. to achieve all of that. Right. Not and even, so yeah. you're, you're going to fall far shorter of the potential. Because of the amount of time, the, the resources. Because given. of the restrictions. Yeah. Namely time, for sure. Yeah. I agree. And so overall, I think that's what happened. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you give, you know, a whole week, if you have like two days, yeah. like that's going to be a way to, you're going to be able to achieve a lot more wow factor because right. you have more time to do it. Well, I mean, even with if yours, they went from six hours to nine hours, so it's 30% more time. Yeah. It, it would be a struggle to do nine hours straight. Like me, I barely, like I didn't, I don't think I drank anything hardly during the whole, you know, seven hours. I was running to, you know, do ours. It was like, technically challenging right yeah um so you give me nine hours it might not get any better because i'm gonna poop out at a certain point yeah but if you did four and a half and then four and a half i could crush it you know <laughs> I, I had a good little chuckle yesterday about like i was thinking back to some of our first interactions and conversations and your idea with my like work-life balance and your seeming amazement of, like how do you how do you do that i was like i, I don't know necessarily it's just kind of like i don't want to overwork myself that seems not smart <laughs> um for all kinds of reasons and I, I do enjoy some hard work you know in within reason with a nice balance to it <laughs> with some good rest time in between which you witnessed and, and saw um but dylan saw it a lot my helper he was like why are we the only ones running and crazy like this and he's like people are just like eating potato chips and watching us and i was like well that was brian you know but <laughs> yeah, he's got better work-life balance. <laughs> I was there to have fun. I mean, also something you said about, like, you know, going to Quint's thing uh, that's coming up, or even when we went last time, you're like, I just kind of want to go and relax, relax and hang out and not, like, run all around town looking for things and, like, you know, do yeah. this crazy. I just want to, like, hang out and relax. I'm like, that, me too. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, what are they, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm going to, not initialize, gosh dang it. Everything is words once Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be intentional about I'm going to implement that or whatever, yeah. Yeah, not me. I like you chose to like obsess over that snake obstacle in the thing. Like that's the one that I care about. You know what I mean? That's the one event or whatever. And I choose the build off where I'm like, this is gonna be so intense. <laughs> then you go to Clint's. I'm like, eh. I would, you know, what I was it? Is it? Huh? It's huh. I would enjoy doing that with you because I, I love building stuff like that. I mean, getting creative, like, I, you know, I build my own chicken coops. I built my own snake room. Like, I've got know-how and knowledge in how to be constructive. I, th I think it would be cool if you and I teamed up on something like that because I, I definitely know how to build. Like, yeah. And, um, and I would be, I'd love to do something way outside of the thing like that where we have to move stuff and do, like, precision cuts. And, like, yeah. I love doing stuff like that. Um, but I, I wouldn't, in, in that scenario, you know what I don't love? I was reading this yesterday. is like, I don't love doing something like that when there's like a time where like oh, it has to be done though in like seven hours. That that sounds stupid. Like I'm gonna build mm, something. Yeah. I want to take my time and like right. make sure this is nice and sanded. I don't want you to tell me I'm not done yet. I'm like no, I'll be done when I'm done. Yeah, okay? this is art. Yeah, this is art. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not here to like make it, bang it out real quick. Like, we we're gonna take our time. Make sure it's right. And yeah, then... and that's that is the thing. So I think, so if I break it down, I think my build and Clint's build were similar philosophically in a lot of ways, just like we were, our, our mindset on c competition in the early, you know, pre-games or whatever was similar, right? Even though we ended up with two totally different builds, right? But the, we built the two non-enclosures, is the way I see it. Well, Clint's could like, be we pushed an it enclosure. so far. Well, so could mine kind of partly. No. But, okay, well, let's think about this, though. Like, uh, you mentioned the corner of Clint's. So without any time to address that, is that a suitable enclosure for a reptile? Without any time to address it? Yeah. So, so basically, 
you, we noticed after the build or whatever that the you're the saying back even if corner, that corner wasn't there, would it be a suitable environment for a yeah reptile? that corner it was there. So he like disassembled his cage to a point. To, I think I didn't see any of it, so I'm assuming, but he put like the rock with the real cool rock stuff in that he put in there, and then he could never get the enclosure to fit quite right. So you could stick your hand in a gap in the back, and he also had like sharp screws sticking out everywhere. <clears throat> so <laughs> in that regard. I would say it is no longer a suitable enclosure. It was pushing it. Any enclosure that has more than 80% floor space with no substrate is this tough. Is, this is a lot. This is a lot coming from the guy who didn't build an enclosure. <laughs> I, I started this by saying that Clint's and mine were borderline not enclosures. Sure, sure. I, yeah, I know. It's a stretch to even I call it's, it. I, in I'm fact, just called mine the exclosure. Yes, I know. That was very brilliant. Yeah, so uh, it was clearly not to be an enclosure. What I was trying to do is remove walls and boundaries between sure. you and your reptile. Yeah, no, I think I thought that was cool. When, and, when I first saw you building, I was thinking, because I, I heard you talking about, like, glass and, like, the side. And when I was yeah. over there checking you guys out for me, I was like, man, if he actually, like, turns this into a paludarium, like, this is an easy win. And yeah. I was ready to do what I did the first year, which was, like, just, Recommend like, me? Yeah, don't don't vote for me. <laughs> like, you clearly got to vote for Garrett's. It's the winner. Like, just vote for Garrett's. That's my recommendation. And I was ready to do that this year. But you didn't react like uh, like Ed did. You were clearly meh. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, I mean, given the time constraints and, and the grace for that, like, yeah, it was just like, I, I, the more I looked at it, I was like, ouch. <laughs> ouch? And just like, ouch. Like, like, it didn't, I don't know. It was a lot of, a lot you of hard work. You had higher hopes. I had higher hopes. So I, here's, here's the challenge of like. I don't the, want to take away from because the amount of work you guys put in was definitely more than anybody else. Oh, 100%. yeah. That's the most frustrating thing is, and at this, the time of this recording, I don't know how we did, like voting wise or whatever. Like, I don't know if I'm first or last. Right. You know what I mean? Like, people might be like, I don't get it. I hate it. You know what I mean? Dave did better. Then I'd be heartbroken. But <laughs> sorry, Dave. But um, we love you. But uh, yeah, it was, it was very hard. So to your point of like, I would like to do that and have more time to do it. I, I loved our concept and I wish I had more time because everybody basically had seven hours to decorate their enclosure. I had 45 minutes. Well, so did I, you know, what's funny is that so did I, if you yeah. go end up going to watch the video, like Emily even did a thing when she's walking around, like everybody's kind of putting the finishing touches on their enclosures and she's, and she points over like, and then. Ryan, what's going on? <laughs> it's kind of like what you had going on the first year because I, the, the main part of my enclosure because was... you were eating potato chips and having well, work, work life I balance. mean, I was doing that as well because I had a partner who I didn't want to get in her way for the part that I thought was the most important, which was my initial idea behind the hog heaven, the theme of my enclosure. The first thing I knew was I needed to have these heavenly white puffy clouds. That has That's like the first thing that popped in my mind and I knew need to be the thing that was there and was done well. And we ended up having, you know, to go to the hardware store and, like, get new paint and, like, stuff like that because there wasn't enough of the paint that they had gotten and the colors were off and we were trying to blend them and it just wasn't working. So we literally spent, like, the first six hours getting the paint and the background right, having to repaint it, like, six times. And, oh, wow. And, um, and that was a lot of, you know, Aurora, like, it, doing the painting because I don't know how to blend the canvas in the background. Oh, she, I knew what I wanted. I didn't know how to do it. She busted the clouds She did boss it. When, she, when nice. she finally got to the point, like, we spent... It was, it was five, like hyper realistic, you right. know, not cheesy clouds. No, we, yeah. we spent five and a half hours trying to get the sky right before the clouds even got painted on. Which is probably what I mean. That's probably a short time frame, considering if you had a big canvas and paints, and you wanted to paint the background of your painting, you would spend more than five or six hours on it yeah. for sure. Right. So that so because of that, I mean, it seems ridiculous because the amount of work was so much less you're talking about like physical work and like labor like at least for me especially because i'm just kind of like trying to help her like do you need anything what can i get you like a cup of water and i'm like just trying to like to be supportive as she's getting the blend right for the sky and and i'm doing that but at the same time she's like i'm gonna be doing this for a little bit now and i don't i was like there's nothing if you basically if you could leave me alone Go away <laughs> i was like i mean sure this is really feeding into my work-life balance i'm gonna go play the snake the snake game that i enjoy so much let's check how garrett's doing Maybe have some potato chips. Eh, <laughs> talk with Clint outside and see how, how his struggle's going. Uh, and I, I did a lot of that for the first five hours of the build, for sure. I'd come in and you know ran to the store and made sure, helped make sure to facilitate as much as I could that I needed to. But what I even started to get nervous towards the end. I was like, okay, 
Mm-hmm. And I was like asking her, well, how long do you think it's going to take you to paint the clouds? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, 30 minutes. I was like, okay, okay. I think we're okay. We're okay, right? We're okay. Are we okay? She kept saying, yeah, we're fine. Well, it'll, it'll take I, us all I think day. if I was in that position, I'd get like a cardboard box and start putting all my stuff together so I could just like transport it. Yeah, know? I had ideas. I was like, okay, I know I, want the, I know I want the barn to go literally here. I want this rock to go here. I want this to go here. So I had it planned out in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, the composition was in, in the mind. And I was like, but then you do actually have to put it in and like put the dirt and it always takes a little bit longer. So well, the, the hiccups, is, that's what killed us because yeah. Dylan and I are both accomplished builders of things dylan has built a lot of great stuff around our shop um and you guys can watch our youtube thing or like especially around retic fest where he's like throw out a big thing or whatever but he helped me build like karma's shipping container cage one of the people um and stuff like that so accomplished builders and i had like i literally did plan it down to where i knew i was going to disassemble this cage and reassemble it into a different form factor right and so <clears throat> I had to look at, okay, I can't use any other materials but what comes in the cage. So I studied the enclosure design on Custom Reptile Habitat's uh, website pretty extensively. I even reached out to Paul. I was like, you know, do your guys that put these cages together, do you guys have like a set of CAD designs or something like that that I could look at? And so he got me that stuff. And then I don't know if those were like a first iteration of his designs or something like that, but they w- did not match what we got in several ways and so with the time constraints i was like if i plan it out perfectly then i can do this really quick because it is a an immense build yeah that we tried to do yeah much more so than the wood build that i did the first time um so i had like blueprints and cad designs for everything and then when we got there none of it matched like not perfectly you know it was within reason but how much of what you were doing was to try and throw people off from what you were actually doing out there i got asked that because the first time i went out you guys had a bunch of sticks that you were cutting to size inside of the enclosure like that's the first thing i remember peeking in the thing and you guys were trying to like oh nobody can look in our tent our private tent what we're building away from everybody else and i promise that this is what i saw the enclosure the, as it came the six yeah. foot by two by two not shredded apart into 100 pieces with a bunch of like sticks inside cut to fit inside no that wasn't what was that no what happened was like we brought a lot of tools because we were doing a build and a lot of people didn't bring tools so like for the first hour or two we were helping everyone oh so that was somebody else's enclosure. all someone else's stuff oh. can you cut this well no we have the but, same thing so it's like cut this to fit that and i need this to but go then there what about that like big cabinet thing that was in there, the big wood like it looked like part of a oh no yeah that, so that was, was that, that was just like your did table? Throw a lot of people off yeah they were throwing away an aquarium and it had a stand yeah. so we're like we need some kind of table to work on so we took the aquarium stand and stuck it oh. so we had a tent <laughs> because the first year well it was like multi-purpose like i didn't want anyone to kind of like see what we were doing in the beginning just the very beginning right um and i'll explain why in a minute but I put a tent up because the last time I did this competition, I planned to build the whole thing in the room. And like two saw cuts later, I'm like, this doesn't work. I got 10 YouTubers and I'm ruining all their audio constantly. No one can get any videos if I build this in here. So I took it outside and I built it behind the thing, not quite in the parking lot, but it was hot as balls out Mm. there. I was like, I think it was like 95 degrees. And I was out there for six hours, not drinking or anything. And I was like, I'm not doing that again. So we brought like an easy up canopy and put it on. Sauna. <laughs> well, I put sides on it because what I was thinking is, I, you know, one of my main criteria for myself to next level this build, because I definitely tried to take it to the next level. But I, I have some parallels with Clint's build on this too, I think, which may or may not have worked for us. We'll see how the voting goes. But um, one of it was to make it different, but without doing just another pallet wood build without doing the same thing i want i would like to orient it vertically or arboreally which also works for the species i mean i like super doors and interacting with them and that works best arboreally right so i wanted to orient it like that and i didn't want anyone to have that idea because there are quite a few people that roll in with a very loose idea or sometimes no idea at all so i didn't want anyone else to be like hmm yeah i'll do mine vertically as well and just like take their cage and flip it up on its side and build something because Which, you could decorate it. it wouldn't work well no, it wouldn't work with those enclosures but a lot of the enclosures wouldn't work well for reptiles ultimately there many of them are chosen to be more you know like visually appealing to win votes than to actually long-term house a reptile right so 
at the end of the day. But I didn't want anyone else to have like a vertical idea and like pull it off easily, right? I, I would say like poorly, right? Because it wouldn't have worked, right? Whereas ours works for the intention that I wanted it to. But if they did it easily, then it would take away from the uniqueness of mine because we were the only vertical one. I think that idea has crossed people's minds, but I didn't want them to see that anyone was actually trying it. So until they got far enough into their build that they weren't going to go back and start again, I just didn't want anyone to know it was vertically oriented. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, which would be tough without doing some major modification because just the way the sliders work, you know, it's, it's sliding. Like I said, it wouldn't like, be functional. But guess what? Functional. There's not a single person who put glass on their cage. It was funny. I utilized the sliding glass front as a shelf because the bottom half of our enclosure was more furniture based. And I based it around some nice pieces of uh, industrial design and stuff. I wanted ours to be something that you would use in the regular livable part of your home, not which actually is usually not a good place to keep reptiles, right? Too much noise, too much stress, too much, you know, they can't get away from it. However, you know, if you're going for mental enrichment, you want to expose them to that in small increments, yeah. right? So the whole thing of mine was like, bring the reptile even further into your daily life. Cause that's what I've been personally enjoying in my reptile keeping journey lately. Um, so that was the, the, the basis of the whole thing. That's why it's not never intended. Everyone's like, like Dave said it too. He's like, well, Garrett, like, I don't think people are going to get it. They're not going to like it. They're going to say it's not an enclosure and you're going to lose votes. He said, just say it's for a chameleon and then people will get it. And it, like, it could work as a permanent totally. chameleon enclosure. But I was like, yeah, but it, I don't want that. I, I wouldn't even want that for a chameleon. Like, that's just an animal that couldn't escape without walls. That's why you'd put it there. But if you really put a chameleon in the central, you know, usable part of your home, it wouldn't be good for the chameleon. You know, what's interesting. the only thing I really don't like about it, you know, I don't like saying that because you guys put in a lot of work and I think it is really cool. I mean, aside from the fact that it leaks all over the place, <laughs> it's just the logistics thing and not having time to fine tune it. But there's the, this, and I'm realizing this, I realized it last night, I'm re realizing it again. There's just this one branch, the, the way that longest branch sticks out, the angle of the dangle. It's literally <laughs> just that. It just bothers me. Okay, so I'm, it's funny that you say that because we're going back to the time now, right? I wanted to build that thing into a bonsai. So what bothers me, and it's all about anticipation, like I think you had one view of what our enclosure was going to be yes. when you guessed it, yeah. and then it wasn't that. Right. So you're like, oh, it fell short. Totally. But my enclosure was never intended to be what you thought it was going to sure. be. However, from my perspective, there were things about it that I didn't get to finish because, like I said, I had 45 minutes to do the entire decorating of the thing. Yeah. And our decoration included a lot of constructed hardscape, which yours didn't, right? It was like placement and everything. Right. So we had the placement of whatever plants and elements and stuff. But then I also had this... I basically was trying to build a bonsai tree out of dead branches and live plants in a sustainable long-term way that would actually work and be beautiful. And that's why my water feature was like just a drip feature. I wanted to just kind of like splash around a little bit and, and water like not all over the outsides, but like you said, it actually would work. You have to like twist the hose this way, whatever you, totally. can, you can fine tune it. Yeah. But um, I wanted to water all the plants and everything. So, so yeah, I, I was, it, it took, there were so many setbacks and hiccups because of minor changes, things that I planned for intensely and put a lot of work into the planning stages of how I was going to execute this level of deconstruction, reconstruction. Because I'm out, I, even if I had taken only half the time to do it, it's cutting my time in half that I have to be competitive with some very real competitors that have the full time to decorate and I have half the time. So I think I could have pulled off a gorgeous bonsai because I very much am into the composition and form of things. Yeah. And no, I had to were... do like kind of like what was structurally correct. Right. And it ended up being less beautiful because it was more strong so that it would I would at least have a functional totally. product at the end. Totally. And I think that's the only part. I mean, you know, again, not not. I really want to give credit where credit's due and the amount of work. And like it was, again, you guys worked harder than anybody else. Hands down. And it was really cool too. Like I think the way it turned out was very impressive. Even this, even that like that top part, the curve, the the curve front. That yeah, was yeah, challenging. Not, there's nothing like a radial wall. So like right. anytime I see construction, I see a radius wall. I'm like, wow, yeah, <laughs> nice work. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it was just like you said, your lack of time to like fine tune the aesthetic 
right. of the bonsai tree. And for me, I think it's just a simple male on male thing. I'm like, get that thing out of here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Tone it down a little, buddy. That's funny. <laughs> We're not all working with that. <laughs> well, so our plan was actually to deconstruct the thing and have it reconstructed within two hours. And then we would have five, according to their time frame, to decorate. And then it, it flip-flopped and, he, and then some, where we took over six hours to do the structure of it. Because, like, the way the enclosures were put together were, like, dadoed and stuff. One of the biggest challenges is he has a double layer of half-inch PVC sandwiched. Yeah, the front, that. And it's glued and screwed. And I asked him, he goes, yeah, that's screwed together. When we got there, we're like, this is not just screwed together. It's glued together. It's not coming apart. You know? And so I was like, I have a lot of pieces that I need for structural integrity that's supposed to be used out of these pieces. And so I still had to utilize everything because I only had so much material. So I had to utilize that, but there was like double and triple layers of dados in there that they're cutting on a CNC machine that I then had to do with a router and a handsaw. Yeah. So I was like, oh my gosh. And I don't know <laughs> if you noticed, like it fit together very nice. Yeah. There were not a lot of gaps. There was yeah. no, that all worked really well, but it took me hours right. longer to get totally. it right. Whereas in my CAD designs, I had them flipped such, such a way that psh, these things plugged together. It was good to go. Totally. Yeah, no, it was, it was good, man. I was, um, I was planning to come out and help at some point, but I, I was not planning for our sky to take five and a half, six hours. Yeah, and we didn't need the, like, last time we needed help or we would not have finished. This time we finished, it just, the parts, like, we spent our time on the actual structure and integrity of the build. Yeah. Because to me, that was important. Yeah. You could you could redecorate it to your taste at home, but you're not going to be able to do the structure at home. I was I was worried for, for like, when it's towards the end there, I was like, because especially when, it, like you said, what my idea was of what it was going to be, I, especially since I heard you talking about, you were at some point talking about, like, finding glass and putting it on the sides. Like, I was out there and you were talking about that for a moment. Yeah, I was going to start cutting into some of those used aquariums yeah. to do some. Not it's, not enclose it the way you were thinking, but I was going to use glass for stuff. Yeah, so I was, I was thinking, like, it was still going to be an enclosure. Like, you're just doing a paludarium, which I was like, dude, these, this is going to be next level. So that, make a that was the, the, the two big changes for that cage versus what it says. You can go on their website and see what they offer with that cage, and they were different. Mm. One was that the sliding glass front was not glass. It was acrylic or mm. plexiglass. That messed my plans up because I was like, okay, we're going to use this glass. And it's just a different material. And I was repurposing it. So when you change the material, you're like, it cannot be repurposed the same way now. So that changed it. The second thing was the tops. I don't know if you remember in the first year, the top is like a flat aluminum laser cut or, or whatever screen. Right, this was just actually like window screen. It was just screen. like window screen. Yeah. And so I was like, I can't use that because the flat aluminum screen has structural integrity to it. So I found these old aquariums that had a, a wire mesh, a heavier screen, yeah. and I had to incorporate the frames and everything. And they were, they were, ready, took they were ready for you. Like they, 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 they did set up like when we walked up and, I was, and there was literally two pallets leaning like right there. Was like, he did tell me. He's like, I saved a couple pallets. I'll tell you what, though. If I had to do a pallet build, I'd have been screwed this year. Why? Absolutely screwed because the pallets were not the right kind. They were not the right material. Those other ones, I remember, I don't know if you remember me talking about the heat treating stamp. Not, none of them were treated. They only had two that were even dry, mm. two pallets, which is very limited amount of material, especially for a six-foot enclosure now. I just never would have been able to do it. Yeah. That The other ones that were wet, when I say wet, they were like had isopods rolling through them. Right. And, you know, like they're rotten and couldn't be used. So we struggled to get a few trim pieces because I wanted to harken back to the pallet build for those who were like, oh, I liked his pallet thing. Yeah. So like Garden State, for example, they did a six-foot Garden State in enclosure, but it was very, very similar in every way to their last enclosure, which won for them, and it was beautiful. Yeah. So to go full circle to, to uh, Ed's not meh comment about the way that we did it, I think that some people like me and Clint like to push the envelope and we almost pushed beyond to where we went so far into our theoretical ideal that it became less practical, like less practically impressive, hmm. right? Where he, he had my dings against his, you know, or whatever. Like it, somebody may love it. Again, I don't know who won at this point. But he didn't have enough substrate surface out of a six-foot cage. 
you know, whereas someone like Adam Wickens was supremely usable for a reptile. Totally. And his would be, it was much more like, I guess you could put a reptile in it, but you'd also have to repair some of the tore apart parts of the cage, right? So those are the two dings. Uh, and it's similarly mine, like he was going so much for his concept that he started to make compromises and sacrifices the usability of the cage. And mine was way further in that way because you're like, you're, you're like, it's not even enclosed. It's not an enclosure anymore. I was like, yeah, my idea was not to do it as an enclosure, but maybe that's too far. Whereas when you had, so that's why it was like, meh, right? Yeah. Like you went too far. You had a perfect balance before. I'm pretty happy with mine, dude. Well, I mean, yours was not that way. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So what I was going to say about the Garden States build or your build or any of that kind of stuff, like yours was like kind of a classic theme build, right? I built a theme around the animal that I was going to build it for, is that we have now seen that three years in a row. So those themes might have been more impressive in year one, two, three. Mm. By year four, you're like, okay, more themes. Mm. That was ingenious in the beginning, and now it's been done. Mm. You know, sure. They were all unique. No one did them exactly the same. Right. But they yeah, were familiar, I, I definitely too wasn't familiar, so they're less impressive. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was still coming off of like it was almost like I was doing it the first time, you know, because I didn't honestly pay too much attention to the other, the other ones. I was like, oh, gonna, there's more build offs. I'm not there. I'm doing something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm pretty happy with how fun it's more functional i know it just has like a look like it just literally looks like you plop down on a farm in iowa or the midwest or somewhere and yeah but th there's actually a lot of functionality in in there that that uh is i mean even with just the barn the toy barn like for the size snake that it's intended for there's all these little compartments in there for them to go in, in and explore oh, okay. like there's cool. like there's multi-level <laughs> inside that barn that you can it's like a little spots, doll like, house it's like a doll house right <laughs> Yeah. And you can go inside and like hide in there, and then that big rock off to the side is accessible underneath, and it was removable, and you yeah. can, they can go in there and hang out in the big rock. The water's the water thing, but then there was also like just the different changes in the landscape. Like I had intentional rolling hills; so they can go over that, and then a side that is cool with a forest. It's like it's a forested side that's yeah. cool and not as warm. They can get the warm hide in the barn and hide out in there and, and be in, in the barn and, and warm and, and hidden and thigmotactic. But they could also be cool and think more tactic over in the forest, and there's like a little cow skull that I didn't even talk about that was hidden behind the tree. I didn't really I want didn't to see it. Prominent. Yeah. yeah, you can't even see it. I've, I've wanted, you can see it if you really look at the enclosure. Yeah, you got to get your head in there and yeah. explore. But it's a little cow skull over there, kind of in the spot where like it would be a, a dead cow off to the side. And there's, and then there's a, an actual cold hide in the back that the ones that you can lift the lid off and it's hiding behind the tree. And so yeah. there's like all kinds of, it's very reptile snake. I, I think snake a lot of, way. I think a lot of, people's builds have a lot of features that people will never know mm. like I, I remember with the exchanging of the screen and the, i was like okay i gotta use what we have but i still want to make it cool i actually took a piece of foam and i carved like hand carved a, a decorative wrought iron fence and then attached it grafted it to the the smaller screens that i had to to work with and uh casey from garden state came out she's like holy crap you made that foam look like metal it looked like a rusting metal handmade wrought iron fence and dylan my helper was getting pretty mad at me because he's like you're spending too much time on that i'm like you're spending too much time with the pallet wood trim pallets easy to work with you know whatever <laughs> you know? but uh but i was really proud of that thing it looked amazing but you got to get your head up in there to appreciate it right. especially because a lot of it got hidden. covered yeah yeah but the thing with mine was I wanted a tree growing through a fence. So that was like the concept that I wanted to be impressive. Right. And also the one that ended up falling short. The fence was awesome and the tree was less than awesome. Yeah. So Sure. But anyway, speaking of which, we, uh, it's go. 10, 15. I was supposed to be there at 10 to clean up because last time, uh, last night I was dead after trying to tackle that build what's amazing is that we've somehow without trying have kept these podcasts to one hour and 20 minutes every single time <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> that's it just feels right <laughs> yeah. all right guys uh well hopefully we'll do more of these yeah it, we'll, we'll, jerry and i will keep talking as long as we can stand each other um <laughs> and maybe we'll record it sometimes <laughs> <laughs> sounds good we'll catch you guys then Searchable as a reptile.